Hi everyone. Welcome to the new section, Securing Your Server with a Firewall. In this section, we'll start with the overview of IP tables. Then we will look at uncomplicated firewall for Ubuntu systems, Firewall D for Red Hat systems. Then we will work with NF tables, a more universal type of firewall system. Now we move on to the first video of this section, that deals with an overview of IP tables. In this video, we're going to take a look at where IP tables are used. Then we will perform a hands-on lab for using IP tables. We will start with the basic usage of IP tables. IP tables consists of four tables of rules, each with its own distinct purpose. Filter table is for basic protection of our servers and clients. This is the only table that we would normally use. NAT table, Network Address Translation, or NAT, is used to connect the public internet to private networks. Mangle table. This is used to alter network packets as they go through the firewall. Security table. The security table is only used for systems that have SE Linux installed. Since we're currently only interested in basic host protection, we'll only look at the filter table. Each table consists of chains of rules, and the filter table consists of the input, forward, and output chains. We'll first look at our current configuration with sudo IP tables L command. So type the command. We get this output. And remember, we said that you need a separate component of IP tables to deal with IPv6. Here we will use sudo IP6 tables L command as shown here. In both cases, you see that there are no rules and that the machine is wide open. Unlike the SUS and Red Hat folk, the Ubuntu folk expect you to do the work of setting up a firewall. We'll start by creating a rule that will allow the passage of incoming packets from servers to which our host has requested a connection. For that, type this command. Let's look at the breakdown of this command. Hyphen A input. The hyphen A places a rule at the end of the specified chain, which in this case is the input chain. We would have used a hyphen I had we wanted to place the rule at the beginning of the chain. Hyphen M. This calls in an IP tables module. In this case, we're calling in the contract module for tracking connection states. This module allows IP tables to determine whether our client has made a connection to another machine, for example. Hyphen hyphen CT state. The CT state, or connection state, portion of our rule is looking for two things. First, it's looking for a connection that the client established with a server. Then it looks for the related connection that's coming back from the server, in order to allow it to connect to the client. So, if a user were to use a web browser to connect to a website, this rule would allow packets from the web server to pass through the firewall to get to the user's browser. Hyphen J. This stands for jump. Rules jump to a specific target, which in this case is accept. Please don't ask me who came up with this terminology. So, this rule will accept packets that return from the server with which the client has requested a connection. We'll next open up port 22 in order to allow us to connect through secure shell. For now, we don't want to open any more ports, so we'll finish this with a rule that blocks everything else. So type these commands. Let's break it down. Hyphen A input. As before, we want to place this rule at the end of the input chain with a hyphen A. Hyphen P TCP. The P indicates the protocol that this rule affects. This rule affects the TCP protocol of which Secure Shell is a part. Hyphen hyphen D port SSH. When an option name consists of more than one letter, we need to proceed it with two hyphens instead of just one. The D port option specifies the destination port on which we want this rule to operate. Hyphen J accept. Put it all together with hyphen J accept, and we have a rule that allows other machines to connect to this one through secure shell. The drop rule at the end silently blocks all connections and packets that aren't specifically allowed in by our two accept rules. There are actually two ways in which we could have written that final blocking rule. This is one way. It causes the firewall to silently block packets without sending any notification back to the source of those packets. 
The second way is to replace drop with reject. It would also cause the firewall to block packets, but it would also send a message back to the source about the fact that the packets have been blocked. In general, it's better to use drop, because we normally want to make it harder for malicious actors to figure out what our firewall configuration is. Either way, you always want to have this rule at the end of the chain, because any allow rule that comes after it will have no effect. Finally, we have an almost complete, usable rule set for our input chain. This is the rule set. It's almost complete, because there's still one little thing that we forgot. That is, we need to allow traffic for the loopback interface. In this case, we'll insert the rule at input 1, which is the first position of the input chain. So enter this command as shown here. When we look at our new rule set, we'll see something that's rather strange. Hmm. The first rule and the last rule look the same, except that one is a drop and the other is an accept. Let's look at it again with the hyphen V option. Now we see that low for loopback shows up under the in column of the first rule, and any shows up under the in column of the last rule. This all looks great, except that if we were to reboot the machine right now, the rules would disappear. The final thing that we need to do is make them permanent. There are several ways to do this, but the simplest way to do this on an Ubuntu machine is to install the IP tables persistent package. Enter sudo apt install iptables-persistent. During the installation process, you'll be presented with two screens that ask whether you want to save the current set of iptables rules. The first screen will be for ipv4 rules, and the second will be for ipv6 rules. So here is the first screen, and here is the second one. Select yes for both. You'll now see two new rules files in the etc. iptables directory. Go to the directory. If you were to now reboot the machine, you'd see that your IP tables rules are still there and in effect. Now we will perform hands on lab for basic IP tables usage. You'll do this lab on your Ubuntu virtual machine. First, shut down your Ubuntu virtual machine and create a snapshot. You'll roll back to this snapshot for the lab later. Start Ubuntu again. Log in to your account. Look at your IP tables rules, or lack thereof, with sudo IP tables L. Create the rules that you need for a basic firewall, allowing for secure shell access, but denying everything else. Run these commands. View the results with sudo ip tables l. Oops, it looks like you forgot about that loopback interface. Add a rule for it at the top of the list with this command. View the results with these two commands, sudo ip tables l and sudo ip tables l v. Note the difference between the output of each. Install the IP tables persistent package and choose to save the IPv4 and IPv6 rules when prompted. So that is already done. Reboot the virtual machine and verify that your rules are still active. 
That's it for this video. In the next video, we will learn about uncomplicated firewall for Ubuntu systems.